So welcome to the Orville Earth Institute. This evening I'm going to give a presentation that's kind of one of our basic presentations that gives a bit of a context of Earth all around the world. It's called Earth and Architecture, Tradition and Modernity, a Journey Around the World Through Techniques. Earth and Architecture in the world, uh, many people think that Earth and Architecture works in some contexts and not in others, but in the uh, orange area we have areas that have extensive earth and, ar uh, earth and architecture and mostly every country in the world um, and with uh, the exception, well every continent in the world with the exception of Antarctica and most countries in the world, there's not so much earthen construction in the very, very Nordic regions but I'll show you even some examples of very high altitude, extremely cold climate buildings. 50% of the world population still lives in earthen buildings. This is something that's changing very, very quickly right now. So <laughs> in the next decade, uh, this is going to go down to 40 and then less because of the spread of the reinforced concrete market into um, more, uh, more rural, more isolated, more traditional environments uh, progressively. And we've been working in places like southern Algeria where uh, cement is shipped in from 2,000 kilometers away in order to build with concrete. So this is just about everywhere. A lot of world cultural heritage is built with earth. A lot of heritage and danger is built with earth. This is a climatic map. So this is one of the major important parameters that have historically shaped the way earthen building traditions have been developed. So whether we have uh, the hot and humid tropical monsoon climates like in Tamil Nadu or we would go way up into the Himalayas, uh, the, the climate itself is very much impacting the forms, so the morphologies of the buildings as well as the, as, the types of, uh, as the types of techniques. So if you have really thick wall system that generally tends to be for either cold climates or for uh, arid climates because thermal mass is very efficient bioclimatically to keep people uh, warm in the cool seasons and cool in the warm seasons. Now we flip a little bit to the soil map of the world and again that's another important criteria is uh, soil is one of these materials that's so infinitely varied that if we zoom in from the, the global map into the continental maps, into the regional maps, into the local maps, and zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom further, then we'll get even a higher degree of diversity of each one of the soils. So uh, in any given area, of like a five kilometer radius, we may have something like this range of soils, depending on the type of place, right? And each place is different. And each place, the soil is, um, is, is, uh, has been formed over a period of uh, hundreds of thousands of years that has been, of course, impacted by human development, but it's mostly developed from the principal parent rock that soil has, has been derived from and the various chemical and physical processes that take place as rock is broken down to form soil. So this diversity is why building with earth and building with local materials in general is a profoundly different mentality than building with reinforced concrete, right? So if we take um, a standard uh, Portland cement and a standard concrete mix, then it's just about easy to, you know, to industrialize this and have similar properties from one place to another to another. But when we work with the earth, it's first important to understand the soils that we're working with because you don't want to export the soil to a place 2,000 kilometers away. You don't even want to transport it more than 20 kilometers or it becomes useless. You know? The most valuable thing about working with earth, working with the soil, is using the soil that's available in any given place and then selecting very carefully which soils are best for which techniques. This is a, a five kilometer radius in southern Ethiopia, some soils that I had collected while I was doing doctoral research. So. Uh, many of the darker soils are more agricultural soils that have been developed by human processes, so clays that form in flat plains and that develop with lower percolation rates that are then mixed with organics. But the most important thing about building with earth is we never, ever, ever use organic soils or agricultural soils for construction. Okay? So you can say that because organic soils are not best for earthen construction. That's definitely true. If you stabilize with cement, organic soils will break down the cement bond over time. 
uh, organic soils can continue to go through the process of um, of breakdown even within the cross section of a wall after it's been built. But the most important reason we never use agricultural soils in constructions is because agricultural soils are the most valuable and unrenewable well, or extremely slowly renewable resource that's on the face of the planet. Uh, from our varied climate to our varied soils to, uh, to our varied uh, techniques so this is just a bit of a collage of different types of techniques. This one is adobe. This one is cob. This one is laterite uh, block. This is round earth, uh, wattle and dove, compressed stabilized earth block. These are just a quick sample. Now I'm going to go through and talk about each one of the techniques and show some, some vernacular examples and some modern contemporary examples. These primary axes of uh, climate soils and technique have a lot to do with the knowledge that's endemic to a place and um, or, or exchanged between one place and another and the existing human skills. So that's a very important factor when thinking about choosing what type of earth and technique in one place or another because some te techniques work very well with the existing mentality and other ones they don't work with the existing mentality and therefore they're not likely to be taken up in the long term. This is now a graph from Crotaire. This is the 12 traditional earth techniques, and these can be categorized actually according to the amount of water that's, put, that's placed inside of them. So uh, at the top, we have dry or solid state soils, we have humid soils, we have plastic soils, or much more kind of clay, like you know, moldable, uh, malleable, and then uh, liquid mixes. Earth dug out is, uh, it's dug out to create shelters. In most case dwellings are dug out of soft soils, uh, tufts or loes in areas with very hot or very dry climates. Depending on the morphology of the site, earth is either dug in depth into a hillside or it's, or sorry, rather dug in depth or dug into a hillside. This is a hillside example, so you can see the existing morphology, right? And then, um, and then this part of the hill has been in fact plain short with terraces and, uh, and excavated even on the interior. This is another one, so this is dug down. There are actually, it's a very interesting type of, um, of urban layout and a very interesting type of intimate urban layout, right? So you don't have the massive city, but you do have, for instance, the extended family and open space where there's good cross ventilation, um, the types of spaces that people would spend in the evening. But now imagine we had something like this in a monsoon climate, right? Yeah. A lot of water, a lot of erosion. In any case, the soils would, in monsoon climates or other climates would not necessarily be conducive to this type of technique. A lot of the dugout uh, tends to have a much more, I mean, a sort of deep, historic, traditional kind of aesthetic. Like this, these are just erosion cones from over time, so the mountains and the erosion patterns have taken like this. Now you would think um, this is not a kind of modern way of living, or it's not viable in a modern context, but turn around and, um, I mean, we're talking about still thriving, completely unique urban environments. Earth cut. Okay. Uh, soil is cut in the shape of blocks and used like bricks or stones. Such examples are found typically in tropical areas with lateritic soils. So now we're talking about the opposite environment. Lateritic soils can be found in two natural states uh, called a plithite, which is a soft soil which hardens when exposed to air due to chemical reaction of the soil with air or carbonation reaction. I mentioned this before, it's induration. So this is called induration. So basically it's exposed to air, it begins to go through carbonation reaction, and then it hardens. Yeah? So it's soft before, it's hard afterwards, oopsies. And the other is petroplinthite, which is basically, uh, it goes to the induration process under the ground. So it's been hardened a very long time ago, and then when it's excavated, it's already hard. Um, and this is in Burkina Faso, but we have a lot of examples on, uh, in different areas. We have some bands of laterite here. We have a lot of red soils that some people would call a pre lateritic soil, which I don't exactly agree with, but um, part of the reason laterite is um, in so common in these types of climates is it's very iron-rich soil. So what happens is you'll have heavy monsoons, right? Monsoon is raining down, 
and then soils with very high percolation rates. So there's a certain amount of percolation or precipitation that happens and all of the iron oxides and other materials come down to a certain lo level and then just stay in that level, right? So then you have these high mineral rich iron oxide mm -hmm. soils which then can go through these types of reactions. So here they're, they're excavating. Many examples in Kerala, in Arista. <coughs> I mean, in Kerala, when I was last there, they were saying this is now becoming a really lost art. And most earthen architecture is becoming a lost art today because, of course, many people would rather build with concrete than something like this. These are just patterns of excavation in the ground. So this is clinthite again. They, they carve it out like this. They cut it individual blocks. And then afterwards, they stack it so that it can maximize the surface area and then go through the hardening process. At the Earth Institute, we really believe when we have an excavation, this it should never just be, you know, you should never excavate soil or any other material without thinking of the lifetime of the excavation. So we use the opportunity to excavate soil to, um, to bring soil for the building while at the same time introducing uh, percolation systems for uh, for water table recharge, rainwater capture, for reuse, for gardening, or many other purposes, um, decentralized wastewater treatment systems, or daywats, dewats, um, or a number of different things that you can do. So that's also something for your own site development that you may want to. A lot of the time we just, we scope the landscape to make sure water drains away from earthen buildings and that it's best practice for uh, one, um, controlling storm water runoff to make sure you never, what we were saying the other day, you never lose the water off of your site, and two, that you use the maximum for your own benefit and everything else goes back to the groundwater. This is a basilica, you can see the Portuguese influence, uh, 16th century. So even with a very simple technique, you can do quite elaborate things. Earth fiddle. Human soil is traditionally poured into wooden lattice works. It gives thermal mass as well as some acoustic insulation to lighter structures. In more recent applications, dry soil is poured into synthetic textiles, which are held outside by wooden poles or filled in long geotextile mm -hmm. tubes like this. So this is Castle School of Architecture. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gernal Minka, who has done a lot of work in arches, vaults, and domes, and um, this technique of earth is, um, is stuffed into the geotextiles, is slightly dampened. There's generally um, barbed wire or several barbed wires that are placed between one layer and the next layer to confer friction. But in a geotextile, they slip very quickly. Like if you take one geotextile bag of sand and another one, then they'll slide very easily. So the barbed wire is very important to make sure that you have friction between one and the other. That's the main reason why I'm not very keen on this because as a, as like traditionally as a mason, I'm somebody that really wants to have friction between the different layers because I don't really trust metal or mechanical things to confer that in, in buildings. But they're very stable forms with earth bag, mm -hmm. but for instance, when you have uh, single curve vaults, mm -hmm. very difficult to do with earth bag. Uh, it's generally corbelled out like this, but I've seen you know people try to build a true arch with an earth bag technique, and this is catastrophically bad because there's just no friction and there's a, there can be an awful lot of sliding. So double curve forms are better with this technique than singly curve forms. Next, covered earth. Soil has been traditionally used to cover roofs in different parts of the world. In arid climates, either it's very hot or very cold, it regulates inside temperatures due to very uh, heavy or medium thermal mass. In Scandinavia, the earth to cover roofs was planted with grasses, which gives cohesion to the soil and prevents, or prevents erosion. Planted green roofs will provide even more thermal mass because then you have, you have not, only, not only the thermal mass of the soil, but then you have an evaporative, um, you have a evapotranspiration that's happening. So water comes in, you know, you have uh, whatever green bodies are actually uh, absorbing CO2, uh, uh, releasing moisture, causing evaporative. A lot of the time green roofs can um, actually increase the lifetime of a building. Norway, uh, traditional houses, 17th, 18th century. So this is a very traditional one because in a climate like Norway, 80% of the heat of the, the interior, the internal heat of the building is lost through the roof in the winter time. And that's why it's useful in this climate to insulate the roof. 
Uh, but of course, you don't want to lose the soil, so by planting grasses, it controls erosion. This is a more modern example uh, by David Easton, who's sort of the master of quarter of concrete and other techniques in the US. So I'll switch to another technique, rammed earth. Uh, many people know rammed earth quite well. Humid earth is poured into a form or formwork in thin layers and then rammed for greater density. Ramming was traditionally done by hand. Since several decades, soil has been stabilized with, for instance, cement or with lime or their natural stabilizers and rammed mechanically with pneumatic rammers. So, for instance, this is a very good example of a traditional uh, uh, high atlas uh, Moroccan uh, ramming tool. Uh -huh. But this is a, a, a fort, so North Borsh Fort, and 1582. A lot of rammed earth has been used as fort architecture, so much that even uh, I have a co colleague who was being solicited by the Algerian government to to uh, design a building and show research that shows that rammed earth is bomb or blast proof for embassy buildings. Uh, but actually the reason why rammed earth is traditionally used for, uh, for fort walls is because if you were to have a traditional cannon warfare, you know, you know a cannonball goes sailing into this wall. If you had a classic stone masonry and lime mortar fort wall, then you would do a lot of damage, so the blast shock would take a huge check section of the wall away, whereas the earth is um, it's able to absorb so much shock that normally it just <laughs> sucks the cannonball into it, and then you have, voila, a cannonball that you see for all eternity because nobody's going to get it out of there. Um, <laughs> and if you pay attention, some of these traditional buildings you can actually see. I mean, I've gone to buildings and you see, I've never seen kind of that perfect black cannonball image, but lots of ammunition, lots of even large mortars, etc. Um, so, and, and many traditional architectures in areas that are using rammed earth uh, have done this specifically in a protective kind of way. Uh, also, areas this is again in, ramp, in, a, in an arid climate where thick walls or lots of thermal mass is very beneficial to keep, the, keep all of the heat out in the daytime and then that, that heat slowly is passed through the, uh, through the cross section of the wall and then night time when the temperatures drop and it's very cool, mm -hmm. then that is, uh, serves like a battery to heat the interior spaces. Mm -hmm. So with rammed earth you have, larger, uh, you have larger pebbles and larger gravel aggregates, etc. Mm -hmm. Because when you ram the soil, then the, the larger aggregates actually come together like this and then you have smaller aggregates filling the space and so on and so on. And, um, and the, the, the clay works to like lubricate the soil. So you just, I mean, many rammed earth techniques are quite dry, uh, but I'll show maybe some example in Spiti where it's um, a very wet rammed earth. Um, but then you have cold climate areas where there's a lot of rammed earth. So the technique I mentioned in the Himalayas is a very wet technique. And um, so, for instance, like this, so they add a lot more water in the soil. And these guys have rammers, so this is the Tibetan technique. Air is basically the most efficient thermal insulator, unless you have a space that's big enough for convection to happen. So if you have circulation of air, it's no longer an efficient ther thermal insulator. But if you have small pockets of trapped air, it's absolutely, absolutely the best thermal insulator you can choose. Um, so, Patala Palace, Nasa. So these are very, very high round earth walls that are also, you can see traditional masonry always has a, 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 a tremendous thickening at the base because, of course, if you start at the base, then you want greater area for s smaller stress, reduced stress at the base, but you don't need that thickness all the way up. Yeah. Uh, great wall. Big cheating because the Great Wall is the most incredible example of sustainability. They didn't just say, I'm going to build the Great Wall and I'm going to take this soil and I'm going to bring it all the way over there. No, they modified the constructive technique for the wall all along the length, choosing the materials that were most appropriate from a local place. Yeah? So you have this crazy, consistent, monolithic image that is totally, totally site specific. So in the area around Lyon, there are a lot of uh, Incredible earth buildings, round earth buildings that look like this, right? And um, uh, and then I, I learned 
pretty recently that this was an example that actually was some relative of the royal family. So it, it wasn't even the bourgeois that said, well, you know, we want to build this incredible chateau, but we don't have that much money, let's cheap out other things. No. This was the wealthy saying, we're going to take soil from the site, and then we're going to have this beautiful natural landscape with a reflective pond in front of the landscape, and then just move the soil up, and voila, do some pot strings, have some ponds in the corner, and then you have this traditional chateau. Now, just a few examples of newer ones. Uh, Rauch, this is the Googler printing, uh, printing center. It's, he, he does, I mean, Rauch basically is working in Switzerland, Austria, etc. Places where labor costs a lot, okay? And then in order to make earth techniques, which earth are always labor intensive techniques, in order to make earth more affordable, then these developed systems of prefabrication, and then these things are all prefabbed on an extremely long prefabrication line and then with a crane put onto a truck and then installed on the site. So he's transformed quite a lot the thinking about earth construction in Europe to make it cheaper and sort of more uh, industrialized. The soil raw or stabilized is slightly moistened, poured into steel mold, and then compressed with a manual or motorized press. So this is compressed earth blocks C, E, B, C, S, E, B, S, S, P, B, T, C, etc. So um, lots of different names. Uh, it's, it's basically a combination of traditional round earth and adobe. So traditional round earth is compressed, right? So it's using compaction to mechanically compress the soil so that they're stronger. And adobe basically takes a mold and then does a, a quick wipe with a clay soil with a lot of water and then demolds like this. So we have a mold, small mold, and we have compression. Frequently the earth is stabilized, so we often call it compressed stabilized earth block. Uh, Francois Quantereau was one of the earliest that, uh, that was working with systems like saying, let's industrialize Pisa or round earth. This is the first CSED press called the Syndrome that was uh, introduced in the 1950s in Bogota, Colombia. And after that, there's been a proliferation of many, many different types of presses. Um, voila, that all have lots and lots of different types of qualities and characteristics. Some of these are really great examples. I like to say, that I'm proud to say that the, 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 the arm press, the presses sold by produced and manufactured and sold by Areca. Some of them are Sopram's design. Some of them are uh, designed as a collaboration between the Earth Institute and Areca. Really, really high quality presses and some of the most versatile presses on the market. Francis Carey's um, doing some buildings that are quite uh, drawing a lot of attention in, um, in Mali, in Faso. Uh, there are a couple examples here from from Mayotte, there was just thousands of houses built for social housing. Some examples, uh, one built by Sopram in, uh, in arid climates in Saudi Arabia. This is a course that we gave in Amrasat way in South, in uh, Algeria. Uh, this is a building that's, that, that, uh, that Sopram and the Earth Institute team built in the heart of Riyadh. In fact, it, 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 um, it this close to winning the, the, the Aga Khan uh, prize mm -hmm. that year. And the Earth Institute is very well known for use with compressed stabilized earth blocks in tropical and humid monsoon climates, uh, but also very well known for large span vaulted structures. Just to say, in monsoon climates, we can build the CSEB on four, four floors, right, with only a tiny little 24 cm thick wall section. And it's all load bearing, so it's not reinforced concrete. There's no RCC. Uh, shaped earth is plastic earth that's shaped like a potter would, pinch pots. This is uh, not a, a mold or formwork technique. It uh, has the advantage of requiring minimal material and very simple tools uh, and minimal labor. So this is often a traditional te that's te technique that's used for granaries. It's not what I would say is very easily adaptable to modern domestic dwellings, certainly not in monsoon climate. Stacked earth cloud. 
Plastic soil is usually formed in balls, which are freshly stacked on top of each other. This technique has been used a lot long ago in Europe, where it was called cob in England. Uh, this is the French version, so they don't really use balls so much. It's a little bit more wet, and they just use a pitchfork and sort of glom it on top, and afterwards use a cutting tool to cut or plane the surface of the wall. So and this is also the traditional technique in, here in Talamadu. It's a really beautiful technique. I did mention the other day I have a great um, uh, publication that shows all of the traditional rules, thickness, height, load-bearing issues, uh, mix ratios, etc. that I can share with you. Um, a good example in Kula uh, But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the traditional Indian village is changing so fast, and yeah. it's, it's not how people want to live anymore. Unfortunately, it's much better and more climatically appropriate and more thermally comfortable to live in buildings like this than to live in buildings like um, RCC frames with mm -hmm. fire brick and fill. Mm -hmm. um, Saudi Arabia, so here you see classic mm -hmm. arid uh, climate example, a hot arid climate. Uh, Uruguay, mm -hmm. so stacked earth with um, in the more, this is Dorset, so this is a more traditional, quote, cob environment. And even it's quite, uh, there's a lot of rain in places like this too. Uh, cob has been used even in more urban prefabricated uh, um, buildings like this one. Molded earth or adobe, uh, sun-dried mud brick called adobe is undoubtedly one of the oldest building materials of mankind. The oldest identified adobes were produced around 9000 BC um, in Syria. Adobes are made of thick, malleable mud, often with the addition of straw. So the straw is something that prevents shrinkage, right? So you can stabilize earth in many different ways. You can stabilize it by compression, chemically by adding cements or lime, uh, or by tension, by adding fibers. Um, so they're left to dry under the sun, traditionally shaped in wooden, uh, wooden molds, and it comes from the Arabic word to meaning brick. Okay, some hieroglyphics, <laughs> the beginning of adobe, nice example here. This is one of the oldest standing vaulted structures in the world, uh, 1300 BC. And the amount of rain this building has received in all of that time is really a lot. The Manhattan of the desert in, in Shabam, Yemen. Um, so classic hot, arid climate where the buildings are shading each other, really narrow uh, corridors, generally a slight, slightly smaller windows and very, very thick bases. So uh, here um, in Shabam, the earth actually combines adobe and cob. I think the cob is actually at the top and adobe is down at the bottom. Okay, adobe yards, uh, more adobe yards, uh, American adobe yards with lots of big tools. Uh, <laughs> No, but I mean, it's not just the boy toys, but it's the need for industrialization because of the cost of labor. Um, an example in Himachal Pradesh, so Kabul Monastery, Safran was there for the 1,000th birthday of this building. Extruded earth, and then I'm just going to fly through these because these are like modern techniques. So it's basically like extruded through a machine with a die. Um, it's from the fire brick industry. They're often hollow and then cut in length. Um, it was 20th century technique. So this looks like just fire brick, uh, extruded fire brick production, but it's then adapted for soils, uh, not for pure clays, but for, for, for soil mixes. And voila, it looks like kind of anything that you would see in Turkey with your infill concrete wall or something like that, but it's earth bricks. Uh, wall and dub, um, this is a traditional technique that's just a little bit more, it's, um, uh, wall and dub can actually actually can be load bearing, can be non load bearing. It's generally of wood, so the wood structure is carrying the load, and then there's a lightweight panel system in between with these infill walls. The panels are a lattice that's plastered on both sides with a very plastic soil. There are rigid panels that basically uh, come by this plastering technique, and it's often the lattice is made of reeds, sticks, bamboos, etc. You can see an example in the bamboo house around the corner. Uh, this is a very old technique where you have huge timbers and then infill, but it's generally more under, like the classic version is more understood in, like, for instance, Horn of Africa, where you have just reeds or sometimes a few casharinas, and in between you have smaller um, members. Um, formed <coughs> earth is straw clay. This is very clay soil in a liquid state or a slurry that's poured onto straw that's been chopped to the desired 
uh, like so you have a formwork, you put the straw in, and then you pour a slurry on top of that, and generally you compress it a little bit. So it's like straw bale, but it's like a straw earth matrix. And it's tamped. Um, walls are not really load bearing, so they're but they're they're light and they have high thermal insulation and generally have a wooden structure or some other frame structure. This is a more uh, modern version of this technique. For earth concrete is, um, so, yeah, so we've, done, we've done a lot of research on this technique. Soil is in a very plastic state. It's poured into concrete, uh, like concrete into formworks. Often formworks are made for concrete, can be used for this, but we've developed our own special formworks that can be adapted to different types of forms. Soil characteristics have to be very sandy, sandy or gravelly because the more water that you add, the more you, the wall wants to shrink a little bit. So you have to have a lot of inert particles to prevent that kind of shrinkage from occurring. Mm -hmm. So it's more engineered. Uh, they're frequently stabilized, most frequently stabilized. And it's a new technique, so it's not much used for the reason of like what I talked about before, is that the engineering is just a little bit higher to get the mix ratios right, so you don't have that. The real value of portive concrete is that it has um, a better potential for getting into the mind frame of people locally, because they're already thinking the bucket concrete house. So it's also very fast. It's much faster than a compressed stabilizer with log. It's much faster than rammed earth, which means that it's cheaper. Um, but again, the engineering needs, needs to be just a little bit more um, kind of higher level for the mix reach. I like these types of tools for the application of plasters, but the idea yeah. of doing a wall with something like this is just like, you know, the guys that want to play with their toys. <laughs> Still, the termites who will end with are the best of the earth builders, not because they <laughs> build multi-story structures like this, yeah. but because when we look at a tiny little campus like our own over the years, we find selections of, um, this is 30 cm, right? So this is just a tiny little nest, but the intricacy of these things are incredible. Look at this, these mm. vertical uprights, 90 cm. This is on our campus. Right? Now, if you zoom in, 10 cm. The Termites actually are naturally stabilizing soils. Termites do, they, they eat the soil, they, they swallow it, they, they, it mixes with their gut bacteria, they regurgitate it, and then they have a really interesting natural stabilizer that's enough to, um, to support a lot of water from, uh, at least from medium hot months sometimes. In this climate, it's a hot and humid climate, the more the best types of wall systems are actually thinner wall systems, so or, or 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 thicker wall systems that are close to the ground with a lot of ventilation at the top of the building, because mm -hmm. hot and humid is a climate in which you have open windows type of things, so that you really need to maximize the airflow in the buildings in order to. So with, without, if you don't maximize the airflow in the hot, humid season, you, you physically don't feel the cooling effect unless you have a certain speed of the wind. So definitely by maximizing uh, ventilation and by, of course, uh, orienting buildings in the right direction. So like, for instance, realization is oriented in a way that you have the minimum exposure on the east and the west faces in order to uh, reduce the thermal gain that you have in the worst parts and then maximize the surface, maximize the southwest and the southeast winds.